السلام علیکم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی ویلکم یو ٹو دا فورٹی ایتھ لیکچر فار دا سیریز آف لیکچرز آن ایڈوانس کمپیوٹر آرکیٹیکچر وائل کنٹینوئنگ آور ڈسکشن آن ٹو دا ان پٹ آؤٹ پٹ سسٹمس ٹوڈے آر فوکس آف ڈسکشن ویل بی دا redundant arrays of inexpensive disks and IO benchmarks. After a brief review of what we discussed last time, I will be talking about the design attributes and the performance of redundant arrays of inexpensive disks. which is usually referred to as the RAID devices. Last time, we started our discussion with the comparison of the performance of the disk storage and the flash memory. Here, we noticed that the flash memory is six times faster than the disk storage for read purposes and the disk storage is six times faster than the flash memory for data write operations considering a 64K byte memory block. Last time, we also discussed the trends of input-output interconnects. Here, we introduced three different methods, that is, the networks, the channels, and the backplanes. The networks offer message-based narrow pathway for distributed processors over the long distance, whereas the backplanes offer memory-mapped wide pathways for centralized processing over a short distance, and the channels are used for medium distance. The interconnects are implemented by using buses where the buses are classified into two major categories known as the I.O. buses and CPU memory buses. The channels are implemented using input-output buses and the backplanes are implemented using the CPU memory buses. After having a detailed discussion on the I.O. buses and memory map buses, we discussed the bus transition protocols which specify the sequence of events and the timing requirements in transferring information as a synchronous information or synchronous information communication. We also discussed the bus arbitration protocols. These protocols are used to reserve the bus by a device that wishes to communicate when multiple devices need the bus access. Here we notice that the bus arbitration schemes usually try to balance two major factors, that is the bus priority and fairness. The bus priority is 
one which deals with the devices with highest priority to be serviced first. Whereas from fairness we mean that every device that want to use the bus is guaranteed to get the access of the bus eventually. After having the discussion on to the different types of buses, we discussed three different schemes which are used for the arbitration. These schemes are the daisy chain arbitration, centralized parallel arbitration and distributed arbitration. Now after having detailed discussion on to the basic types of storage devices and the ways to interconnect them to the CPU. Now we will look into the ways to evaluate the performance of storage I.O. systems as we have already discussed the performance of communication I.O. systems. In order to discuss the performance of storage I.O. systems, we have to review what we have already talked about the storage devices. We know that if a storage device crashes, then the prime objective of a storage device should be to remember the original information to make the usage of the storage device more reliable, where the reliability of a system can be improved by using different methods. These methods are the fault avoidance, fault tolerance, error removal and error forecasting. Fault avoidance prevents the fault occurrence by construction, whereas the fault tolerance provides service complying with the service specification by redundancy and the error removal minimizes the presence of errors by verification and error forecasting estimates the presence, creation and consequences of error by evaluation. Now with this much introduction about the reliability, let us talk about the three basic parameters which are used to measure the performance of storage I.O. systems. These parameters are the reliability, availability and dependability. These terminologies have been defined by Lapre in his paper entitled Dependable Computing and Fault Tolerance Concepts and Terminology. This paper was published in 1985 in the Digest of Papers of 15th Annual Symposium on Fault Tolerant Computing. Lapre defined dependability as the quality of delivered service such that the reliance can justifiably be placed on this service, where the service delivered by a system is its observed actual behavior and 
the system failure occurs when the actual behavior deviates from the specified behavior. Note that a user perceives a system alternating between two states of delivered service. These two states of the delivered service are the service accomplishment and service interruption. So this actually means that the user has to perceive how the system is switching between the service accomplishment which is the service delivered as specified and the service interruption which is the delivered service which is different from the specified service. However, here quantifying the transition between service accomplishment and service interruption is the measure of dependability. The dependability in fact is measured in terms of the measure of two parameters that is the module reliability and module availability. The module reliability is one which is the measure of the continuous service accomplishment and the module availability is the measure of the swinging between the accomplishment and interruption states on delivered service. It means that availability in fact measures how much swing is there between the service accomplishment state and the service interruption state. That means that for how many time the service is accomplished and it then switches to the service being interrupted. However, here now before we discuss the reliable and dependable designs of the storage I.O. systems, I will first of all try to explain to you the terminologies which are used to measure the reliability, availability and dependability. So let us first of all talk about the reliability. The reliability of a module is the measure of the time to failure from a reference initial instant. In other words, we can say that the mean time to failure, which is usually written as MTTF. So we can say that the MTTF of a storage module, which is a disk, is basically the measure of reliability, which means that the reliability can be measured by measuring the mean of the time which is used in the failure state. The reciprocal of the mean time to failure is the rate of the failure, which means that how many failures occur per second, whereas the service interruption is measured as the mean time to repair, that is the total time which is taken up to recover from the interruption, that is known as the measure of the interruption and it is usually written as MTTR, that is the mean time to repair. Now with having a clear understanding of the 
MTTF and MTTR, let us understand with the help of an example that how can we use these terminologies to measure the availability of a disk subsystem. For this purpose, let us consider an example where we will consider a disk subsystem which comprises 10 disk, one SCSI controller, one SCSI cable, one power supply and one fan. Now let us see that for the given values of MTTF of each of these components, find out the system failure rate and hence the system MTTF. For this purpose, we can assume that the disk has an MTTF of 1 million hours, whereas the SCSI controller has the MTTF of 500,000 hours. Again, the SCSI cable has MTTF of 1 million hours and the power supply and fan, they both have got 200,000 hours each as the value of the MTTF. Now, if we substitute these values results in the total value of system failure rate to be equal to 23 per million hours. Whereas the reciprocal value of this is in fact the measure of the system MTTF and this value therefore is equal to 1 million divided by 23 which is equal to 43,500 hours or equivalent to 5 years. This shows that with this much data given the mean time to failure of the subsystem is 5 years. So this basically gives us how much reliable the system is. So now let us talk about what do we mean by the availability. The availability of a module is the measure of service accomplishment. It is the service accomplishment with respect to the swinging between the two states that is the accomplishment and interruption. The module availability therefore can be quantified as the ratio of MTTF that is the mean time to failure and the mean value of the time between the failures which is usually written as MTBF or the mean time between failure. The mean time between failure is indeed equal to the sum of the MTTF and MTTR. Therefore, we can say that the availability is the ratio of MTTF and MTBF. Now, having talked about what is the reliability, dependability and availability and considering the usage of storage IOs from our last discussion where we have been talking about the channels and backplanes. Today we will discuss the network interconnects to interface multiple processors located at a long distance and they need high performance storage devices. Because the 
processors are placed at a long distance and they usually maintain lar large database. Therefore, the reliability and availability of the storage device become important. We know that a network provides well-defined physical and logical interfaces. That is, the interconnects separate CPU and storage systems. Moreover, the networks are capable of sustaining high bandwidth and they can transfer large data and there is a file server operating system existing which supports the remote access. Hence, the networks attached storage devices required to be more reliable because such systems are very much vulnerable to the reliability and dependability. And therefore, in order to improve both the availability and performance of the storage system, instead of using a big or a large disk to provide huge data storage capabilities, we usually prefer to use the disk arrays. Here you can see that the conventional disk designs had got their uh, voyage from 3.5 inch disk up to 14 inch disk where the 3.5 inch disk is regarded as a low end disk and the 14 inch disk is regarded as a high end disk. Whereas in disk array basically only one size of the disk is used, say the smallest possible size, for example, the 3.5 inch disk. This 3.5 inch disk is stacked in the form of an array. This may be an array as you can see over here with three rows and three columns or with large number of rows and three columns. So this way the overall capacity of an array disk is increased by simply increasing the number of disk arrays. Simply spreading the data over many disks basically forces access to several disks and hence it improves the throughput of the storage system. So we can say that the disk array have potentials for large data and high IO rate. Here its capacity is very high and its size is also very high. Its capacity ranges in megabytes per cubic foot and however its reliability is still a question. The drawback of an array with more devices is the dependability and reliability. The reliability of a disk array decreases because we know that generally N devices have a reliability equal to 1 over N. Now the big question in the design of an disk array, which is particularly the RAID, that is the redundant array of inexpensive disk. The most important 
factor over here is the reliability. Here, let us have a look onto this uh, example where we can say that the reliability of n disk is equal to the reliability of one disk divided by the number of disk. So, for a disk having MTTF equal to 50,000 hours, then the disk system with 70 disk has got a value of MTTF equal to 500,000 divided by 70, which is equal to 700 hours instead of 50,000 hours. So, this shows that the reliability drops from 6 year to 1 month in this example. However, the dependability can be improved by adding redundant disk to the array to tolerate faults. Here, the arrays without redundancy are too unreliable to be useful. Now, let us first of all see how the disk arrays work and then we will talk about the redundant array of disk. In a disk array, files are striped across multiple spindles. This actually means that whenever we have to store a file onto a disk, the file is striped across, which means that it is placed onto multiple disks. It is divided into different sections and its different sections are placed onto multiple spindles or onto multiple disks. Now here, adding a redundant disk to achieve high fault tolerance, it usually yields to the high data availability also. Here, if a disk fails, the contents are reconstructed from the data redundantly stored in the array onto the redundant disk. However, the drawback of a redundant disk is that its capacity penalty to the storage, which means that its storage area is uh, small. No doubt the overall capacity has increased by in adding an extra disk. The redundant array of disk is also known as a RAID where the word RAID, R-A-I-D, stands for redundant array of inexpensive disk or in literature, sometimes it is also written as the redundant array of independent disk. However, let us now talk about the approaches which are used to include redundant array in the disk array. These approaches are usually classified by some numerical value, say the value 0, value 1, value 2, etc. These values identify the level of the rate. Each of these different techniques, they have got different overheads and different performance. The fault tolerance and overhead in redundant disk for RAID, having uh, an example of a disk of uh, user data is shown over here. Here you can see that the Table here shows that the RAID level 0 
has no disk fault survived, whereas the corresponding check disks are also not there. Whereas in the rails of all other levels, there is one disk fault survived and corresponding check disk have got a value either 8 disk or 4 disk or 1 disk. Now let us talk about the rate level 0. The rate level 0 is the disk array without a redundant disk. However, here the data is stripped across a set of disks which makes the collection appears to the software as a single large disk. So this means that basically the data is stripped out across the disk but it is appearing to the software as a single large disk which is holding this whole data. Note that the taxonomy rate 0 is a misnomenclature as there is no redundant disk in this arrangement. But this terminology is usually used because of the striping of the data. Whereas now let us have a look onto the rate 1 which is also known as the disk mirroring or shadowing type of structure. Here each disk is fully duplicated onto its shadow or onto its mirror image. So this means that there is an array of disks and let us suppose that as in this example there are 8 disks in the array. Instead of using only 8 disks to achieve redundancy, exactly mirror of similar 8 disk array is used. However, this type of arrangement is targeted for high rate of uh, IOs and whenever the data are written to one disk, the data is also written onto the corresponding disk in the array of redundant disk. If a disk fails, then the system just goes to the mirror. That means if a system in the original array fails or any disk fails, then it always transfers to the mirror side. So this means that there are eight survivals in this example provided one disk of mirror paired fail. It is the most expensive solution because here we are having a 100% capacity overhead. However, the logical right here is in fact equal to two physical rights because whenever we have to write something onto the array, we have to write the same thing onto the mirror also. If the data worth four disk is to be subtracted and it is to be stored on eight disk, then there are two ways to stripe the data. Number one is that we create four pairs of disk, each organized as a RAID 1 and then we stripe the data across the four RAID pairs. This type of uh, arrangement is known as the 1 plus 0 RAID, whereas the other arrangement is that we create two sets of four disks, each organized as RAID 0 and the mirror writes to both the RAID zeros. That means it writes to the RAID 0 corresponding to original and the RAID 0 corresponding to the mirror. So this type of arrangement is referred to as 
the 0 plus 1 rate. Then we will look into the rate 3 because we know this thing that since 2001 there is no commercial implementation of rate 2. Rate 3 is known as the bit interleaved parity disk. The rate level 3 is in fact designed such that rather than having a complete copy of the original disk as in the case of RAID 1, we can achieve the desired dependability by adding enough redundant information to restore the lost information on failure. So, the RAID 3 in fact uses only one extra disk and this disk is known as the parity disk. This disk holds the check information which is used in case of failure. So this means that in uh, RAID level 3 instead of copying the complete information into a mirror of the array, we simply have got only one disk and this one disk contains the parity information corresponding to each information on the array. The RAID 3 acts logically as a single high capacity high transfer rate disk. Here the arms are synchronized logically and spindles rotationally. So, which means the synchronization is achieved both in the arms as well as in the spindle. However, the synchronization in the spindles is rotational whereas the synchronization in the arms is logical. Here you can see an example of the data storage onto a RAID of level 3. Here you can note that every read or write access goes to all the disk for every read access the parity is computed across recovery group to protect against the disk failure. So, for example over here the information onto the first disk is as it is given in the logical records in the first array the corresponding information for the second row is given in the second one second disk and similarly in the third one it is the third row which is stored. For each of these three values available over here a parity bit is calculated and it is stored in the parity disk. Note that for the rate 3 shown here there is a 33 percent capacity cost for the parity because in this example we are considering that the original array has got three disks whereas the fourth disk is the parity disk. Therefore, the cost for parity is 33 percent of the cost of the array. However, the wider arrays if they are used we can reduce the capacity cost, but it decreases the expected availability and increases the reconstruction time. Which means that if in the disk array instead of 3, if we are using say 20 disk and only one parity disk, the capacity cost for the parity is reduced, but in this particular case the expected availability and the reconstruction cost that is the reconstruction cost is increases and the availability of uh, the data that is decreased. So, with this much introduction about the RAID 1 and RAID 3 level uh, devices, let us talk about the RAID level 4 and the RAID level 5. 
the rate level 4 is also known as the block interleaved parity rate and the rate level 5 is known as the distributed block interleaved parity. Here both the rate 4 and rate 5 level use the same ratio of data disk to parity disk as in the case of RAID 3, which means that if in one row there are four disks for the data, there is one disk for the parity. So its construction is almost identical, but these RAID 4 and RAID 5 devices, they are accessing the data in a slightly different manner. The distribution of data in RAID 4 is shown here. The RAID 4 which is uh, basically the block interleaved parity RAID is one where the parity is associated to each data block just identical to the RAID 3. So it supports a mixture of small read and small writes and large read and large write. However, one drawback of this system is that the parity bit must be uploaded on every time and this particularly give rise to the bottleneck for back to back write. However, this bottleneck is resolved in the block interleaved parity rate that is uh, the rate 5 where the parity disk is distributed amongst the blocks. You can see it from this figure shown over here and you can compare the organization and data distribution in these two structures very easily. Note that from the RAID 5 organization shown here, the parity associated with each row of the data block is no longer restricted to the single disk. Rather, this parity has been distributed onto different rows. Here, this organization allows multiple writes to occur simultaneously as long as the stripe units are not located on the same disk. This we can explain by considering this example where if for RAID level 5 the first write to block A is to be performed then it must also access its parity block P2 that is in order to perform the first write to block A there are two reads from two disk that is the first and the third disk and if we consider the second write to block 5 it implies that an update in P1 is also essential. This is showing that there are two reads for two disks that is the second disk and the fourth disk. So thus we can say that the two writes could occur at the same time in parallel because as you can see in this example, in the first write, the first and third disk are to be accessed and for the second write, the second and fourth disk are to be accessed. However, if you have a look onto the RAID level 4, you can see that both the parity disk P1 
and P2 are on the same disk that is in the fifth disk. So, it would be a bottleneck and could not be written simultaneously. Furthermore, in RAID 4 and RAID 5, the parity is stored as blocks and is associated with a set of data blocks. Whereas, in RAID 3, every access goes to all the disk while the level 4 and 5 use smaller accesses which allow independent access to occur in parallel. Furthermore, in RAID 4 and RAID 5, error detection information in each sector is checked independently for small read to see if the data are correct in one sector. While each small write would demand that all other disks be accessed to read the rest of information needed to recalculate the parity. Now, in order to further understand this, let us compare the recalculation of parity of uh, small writes for RAID level 3, level 4 and level 5. Here, let us assume that we have four blocks of data and one block of parity. The parity calculation of RAID 3 is shown here and as you can see from here, it is very straightforward. The parity calculation reads block D1, D2 and D3 before adding block D0 dash to calculate the new parity. Note that here the new data D0 comes directly from the CPU. So, these are not involved in reading it. The small writes in case of RAID 4 or RAID 5 are as shown over here. Here you can see that the old value of D0 is read which is uh, written over here as read 1 and is compared with the new value D0 dash to see which bit will change. Once it has been checked, then the old parity P is the read and corresponding bits are changed to form P dash that is a new parity bit. This is accomplished by the logical exclusive ORs. In this example, you can see that the three disk reads that is D1, D2, D3 and two disk writes that is D0 dash and P dash involving all the disk are replaces with the two disk reads that is D0 and the parity P and two disk writes D0 dash and P dash each involving just two disks. Hence, we can say that the one logical write in RAID 4 and in RAID 5 is equivalent to two physical reads and two physical writes. Now here, with this much discussion about different types of reads at RAID level 0, RAID level 1, RAID level 3, 4 and 5, we can see that we have achieved redundancy, availability and reliability by using arrays of inexpensible disks. Now with this much discussion about the performance enhancement of storage IOs, we conclude our discussion for today and next time 
we will be talking about the other factors which are involved in the IO performance and are used for internet networking. So till then, I say you Allah Hafiz. Thank you.